poets, and but mainly uh, visual artists, and Melcher, uh, uh, a lot of local guys. And we kept trying to figure out what to do. And uh, I, in the meantime, had taken up the slant step, uh, maybe through Bruce's influence. And I did Rhino Becomes Slant Step, Slant Step Becomes Rhino. I was messing around with it too. And we kept having these meetings and getting drunk and having fun, but we weren't coming up with a show. So I said, well, I'd like to do a show dedicated to the slant step. And they were like, oh, God. <laughs> but nobody could think of anything else to do, so we ended up um, doing uh, variations. Anti, my memory, Melcher had a big anti-slant step thing. And, uh, slant steps out of bread, slant steps with teeth on them, films about slant steps. And so uh, we... <laughs> the night of before the opening, uh, we went in and we arranged everything, hung all the, there were paintings and drawings and constructions and collages, put it all up like a regular exhibit, and okay, see you tomorrow at the opening, and on the way home back to Mill Valley, Alan, Hudson, and I, two or three or four of us, kept talking about the show, and I said, it's not right the way it is. Uh, the way we set it up. So we had the keys to the gallery and we drove, <laughs> we drove back in and we took everything down very carefully and piled it in a huge heap in one corner and set the slant step back out by itself. And the next night at the opening, everybody was stunned. At the, uh, <laughs> but then they were, yeah, right on. <laughs> That's the way it should be. And, um, we also had a slant stick raffle, and uh, people bought raffle tickets. And uh, at the end of the show, we, we assembled again. There was a panel discussion with Alfred Frank. <laughs> and uh, people had a winning number, and they'd have to go carefully paw through this huge heap of art in the corner and leave with their um, thing. The last day of the show, uh, Bruce and Frank uh, Williams uh, were uh, setting the gallery and they took a break and, and went back for uh, lunch. And uh, when they came out with the slant step, everything else was there, but the slant step was gone. And it turns out that Richard Serra had stolen it and uh, took it to New York. And then some collectors from uh, from the Bay Area were in his studio about the time he was doing some of those thrown lead splash pieces and they said, hey, isn't that the slant step? <laughs> <laughs> and he said, yeah, he felt kind of bad about it. Maybe you should take it back to, <laughs> to San Francisco. So uh, they brought it back and then it had a lot more adventures uh, before um, Art Shade and Frank uh, Williams uh, performed uh, 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 Organized the Slant Step Protective Association. <laughs> <clears throat> kind of the final word on that is the whole trip about the piece was what in the hell was it used for? <clears throat> and so he's a shoe shine stand, not that thing in the back, because it had marks like it had been used. And it was just too weird. Nobody could come up with an adequate uh, explanation. Steve Kaltenbach did a kind of very slick vacuum formed. Looked like it came from Italy in different colors. <laughs> Slant Step 2. And just beautiful, about the same scale. And there was a gallery in Main Lane at the time, Reese Paley Gallery, and he had a Slant Step 2 sitting on a very nice pedestal. And one day a lady came in and says, Oh, I haven't seen one of those in years. And the director said, do you know what this is? And she said, oh yes. She said, the turn of the century, everybody had one in their bathroom. It's to elevate your feet to give you a good bowel movement. <laughs> <laughs> and we all agreed that was probably the... <laughs> Ever so often it resurrects itself in another... <laughs> In another show or venue, and so, well, being some San Antonio artist, take note. <laughs> <laughs> just, just, just as it says. <laughs>
Okay, let's move on. To <laughs> yeah, once you break open this lamp, <laughs> there's no room for you. <laughs> yeah. Tell us about this um, this uh, Mona Lisa. White white yeah, white palette. Like yeah. 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 Well, of course, I'd seen uh, Salvador Dali's or Duchamp, 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 yeah. Duchamp's uh, mustache at, uh, uh, and uh, L H O O Q, uh, which somebody said I never know what that means. And uh, it was teacher Davis Seymour Hart says means she has a hot ass. <laughs> so um, uh, I decided I wanted to do something with Mona, so I bought a reproduction of her at uh, the San Francisco Museum. And I decided first thing I'd do, I took some escutcheon pins, these little silver round-headed nails, and nailed her to uh, the uh, piece of plywood. And in doing that, I kind of abrased, uh, you know, uh, sanded a little bit with, I don't know, something I was using. And I saw that if I started sanding on it a little bit, it, it revealed almost like an underpainting. And so I took a little piece of canvas, little gray thing, little gray patches, and that's what I used to wipe her out with. And uh, there at the bottom, I just left more of the thing and just used the canvas over the escutcheon pins. Were you thinking about the erased Kooning or anything when you were doing No, this? I didn't know about that. Huh. Yeah. Mm -hmm. okay. yeah. What's it all mean, Bill Wiley? <laughs> <laughs> Anybody got any ideas? <laughs> uh -huh. Well, this piece, actually, I was back east at the time. I'd gotten a grant from the university and took, took a year uh, off and uh, went to Europe for the first time. And uh, Wayne Thibault, who was uh, making a lot of headway at the time, had made contact with a number of uh, New York artists and had invited them out as guest teachers. And uh, Elaine de Kooning and Paul Waldman and Don Nice and one of the last ones that came out, Joseph Raphael. And we got to be friends, and uh, so he was always saying, if you're a really serious artist, you have to be in New York, you have to come to New York, and I don't know, maybe. So I thought, well, I'd exhibited there a little bit with Frumpkin, but I'd never been to New York, so instead of staying in Europe, I ended up going back to, uh, found a place in New Jersey, and, uh, and hung around for uh, nine months in, uh, in New York. and. One time, uh, Joseph came out uh, for a visit, and uh, my family and I found a place, uh, like I say, in New Jersey on a little lake and uh, some studio space below. Anyway, he'd gone through some tragic event, a friend had died or some, some bad, and he was sitting in this chair, he'd been talking about it for, he said, oh, what's it all mean anyway? And uh, when he said that, I just hallucinated uh, a palette and, um, What's it all mean? Uh, just uh, on the other side, it says a sign from the country painter. <laughs> so uh, here's a pyramid. We saw the triangle shape in the um, Columbus piece. So yeah, something that seems to recur. I think. Yeah, know. just a motif that keeps coming back. Uh, probably the Egyptian influence. So this is some um, uh, uh, outdoor sculpture. Was this the first one you did? Yeah, it was. A, it was when minimalism and, and uh, you know having other people fabricate things was uh, mm -hmm. happening. And uh, a lady in uh, uh, Pennsylvania, Audrey Sable, had uh, been very generous to artists, and uh, and she bought a piece or two of mine. And uh, so. Uh, I came up with this idea for a stainless steel uh, pyramid, ball and chain, and um, proposed it to her uh, for the price of the materials. And uh, she okayed it and found a place and uh, had it fabricated, and uh, and it's in her backyard. And and why did you dedicate it to Marcel Duchamp? I just thought he needed. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> Artist, tool, and die maker. Uh, you know, sort of opening things up and cutting them off at the same time. And so that, uh, and uh, Mrs. McCartney, uh, Linda Eastman, took the photo. Ah. She wasn't Mrs. McCartney at the time. Okay, now this is a kind of watercolor format that you've more or less continued to use over the years. So this is yeah. the first one 
we're looking at. Um, so tell us about this kind of when we started making these watercolors and then specifically what this one is about. Hmm. Uh, thinking I might stay in Europe and then finally deciding no, I, during that year I had off. Uh, when I was in England I picked up a little uh, you know, pan watercolor set and thought well maybe I'll do some watercolors and I never really worked with watercolor much. Uh, maybe in high school, gouache, uh, tempera, that kind of thing. And uh, when I, like I said, when I got to the Art Institute, there, everything was so big and huge canvases and oil paint. And, everything. and I kind of hit a wall at that point where I just wasn't quite sure what I wanted to do or how I wanted to do it. And so I stopped making art for a while uh, during that period of traveling around Europe. And then when I first got set up in New Jersey, and I thought, well, Maybe I'm not going to be an artist. I always thought I was, but uh, maybe not. And so now I'll just wait and see what I'm supposed to, what my next assignment is. And uh, one day I just decided, uh, I got that watercolor pan. I think I'll try some watercolors. And uh, so much like I did as a kid, almost comic book style, I made a, if all the initial ones were quite small. And I wanted to take all that all the hassle out of trying to come up with something uh, unique or original. I just said to hell with all that stuff, I'm just going to do this. And so I would uh, make a drawing, uh, sometimes based on something I saw or something was happening around me. And I also uh, started adding, uh, I'd always messed with words and titles and stuff and occasionally a word and a piece, but at that point narrative became a much bigger part of the um, of the work, and so uh, this just refers to uh, you know what's happening in nature, and uh, the title life says you know lame and blind and eaten, which uh, we still are for the most part, I think. Uh, so you're talking about environmental concerns, which, as you just mentioned, has been an ongoing topic for you. Yeah, uh, one of the things that I think uh, figures uh, strongly into that concern is uh, <clears throat> having lived in Richland, Washington. We actually first, uh, from Indiana, moved to the state of Washington, lived there for a year, left Washington, moved, this <clears throat> mostly with the house trailer, moved around through the states, ended up coming to San Antonio, where I had an aunt and uncle, an uncle that sold, sold graves, which was very weird for me as a kid. I was about 12 at the time. He's always working at home on the phone called Before Need. Anyway, um, uh, we stayed here for about a month. I went to school at some local school and then started heading north again. And uh, somewhere between Corsicana and Ennis, there's a little town called Rice. And uh, we bought a cafe and filling station there and uh, ran that for a year. The place was uh, kind of destitute uh, in terms of water, so we, we were just barely staying alive. So we sold that, moved back to Washington. And that's when I became more aware of what Washington was really about. Richland uh, processed along with New Mexico, some of the first, and Oak Ridge, uh, Tennessee, the first plutonium for the atomic bomb. And uh, Richland's one of the most uh, polluted places on the planet. Really? Actually. Yeah, yeah. It's because just like in many cases, when they were, this was all under the threat of war. Uh, didn't know that much about what they were doing, so a lot of things were dumped in, you know, in the desert and in the Columbia River, and uh, so that kind of locked in uh, that uh, what we're messing with there. And uh, as we see currently. Uh, Nothing to worry about with nuclear energy. <laughs> okay, and, and now you're you're starting to get into the very complex assemblage, moving from the wall to the floor, lots of objects, uh, ship's log. Yeah. And you you were looking at Westerman around this time, weren't you? Got to know Westerman. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah that was a major. Uh, major fine influence and uh, got to hang out with him a little bit. Yeah, his work, I think, is still highly undervalued, uh, both the graphic and the sculpture. Mm -hmm. Great artist. artist. Great, Great artist. artist. H.C. Westerman. Yeah. yeah, artists know about Westerman, but they a lot do. of the yeah. collectors don't. So. 
But this is going back a little bit to Columbus rerouted again and uh, making a kind of voyage in my mind. And the ship's log is a day-to-day -day kind of diary of uh, this imagined voyage that uh, we're taking to God knows where. And it's me as the captain writing down my thoughts and dealing with the crew. And then I just kind of assembled this uh, partially uh, ship-like, there's canvas and wood, and, and just kind of put it together as a kind of almost ship or something. And, uh, and the ship's log is a little watercolor of a, of a sailboat with a log for a, for a hull. Yeah. And then this is, uh, I guess, an installation that you also translated into a watercolor? Yeah. yeah, yeah. I would often do, after I finished a construction, not knowing what to do, I would uh, uh, do a, a little portrait of it in watercolor. And then occasionally another idea about the piece would pop out, and uh, so a narrative line would, uh, would be added. So, and then of course, this is a great example of you're really known for your puns um, in addition to everything else. So, Here's one of your, your puns uh, in the title. And what's the narrative then in this one? Um, I have to read it. It's, it's just a, a kind of thought about my father um, mm -hmm. and me as a child. Uh, he did some surveying. In fact, he laid a lot of the roads in Indiana. And I would see his uh, surveying instrument in the closet, never quite understanding what it was or what it kind was Kind of like a landscape. Well, yeah. <laughs> yeah. And so the writing refers to, uh, to that mm -hmm. and uh, his eventual demise. And this is pretty minimal compared to some of the things you were doing at the time. Yeah, well, minimalism was kind of, I think, appearing at that point. And uh, that just came, somebody saying, well, that art's extreme. And I thought, extreme art? And <laughs> <laughs> Again, the master of the pun and the visual image at the same time. So, and again, in keeping with this sort of very abstract, very minimal, but a very lengthy title. Can you read it? I can't read it from here. Uh, I wish I could have known earlier that you have all the time you'll ever need. Right up to the day you die. <laughs> and I just, it was. Uh, still learning about watercolor and working with them and uh, so, so the imagery meant to evoke the idea of a calendar sort of or the passage of time no I, I just uh, decided to work with a grid which I don't think I'd ever worked with before mm -hmm. and grid the thing a piece of watercolor paper and finally I got out of the small scale was using you know 22 by 30 sheet regular sized uh, thing and just decided to work with a grid and um, uh, and just start working with the colors. Actually, you know, no, nothing in mind really. But right so it was pretty random in terms of where you where you place the colors. Yeah, just trying to keep it interesting uh, so that there weren't two, you know two yellows together or you know whatever. So uh, yeah, there wasn't anything much more than that. But right before I decided to fill them all in with color, I put in a little patch of earth, which uh, one one weed coming up. And, and now this is uh, relating to Ship's Log and this body of work yeah. combines painting and sculpture. Yeah. Random remarks and digs. Yeah. Yeah, it, it, just the idea of a, of a mirror, the painting being a mirror and the construction kind of mirroring uh, what's going on in the back. And um, I started, feel, I was going to make all these like balls or marbles on the floor and I started filling them in, but it got to be kind of a chore, a bit of a drag. And so I thought, uh, conceptually, uh, I know what I'll do. I'll stop at this point and I'll uh, propose that whoever ends up owning this piece, um, each year that I continue to live, uh, I'll, I'll uh, paint in another ball. <laughs> and. Uh, so I, there's still a lot of blanks. I'm, I'm way behind on this piece. <laughs> <laughs> but it was owned locally for a while by um, David and Mary Robinson. And oh. at one point they phoned me and said, Wiley, you're still alive. And uh, some, of these balls, <laughs> some of these balls are calling. And so I went over and, and, and painted up to what I was at that point. I don't know, 32 or something. 
And uh, while I was there, David was talking about just all some of the random remarks and things you hear. And so I wrote some of those uh, on the bottom, just more narrative. Uh, Look at the size of those feet. And, uh, you know, various things you hear people say. World at large. World at large. Yeah, again, just kind of conceptualizing uh, that I wanted to work with this. Oh, I know what it was. It was uh, uh, seeing a, an exhibit of Joseph Albers at the San Francisco uh, Museum. Mm-hmm. And I uh, next to the square. Uh, next to the square. And then, you know, San Francisco didn't have much of a relationship to minimal abstract pieces at that point. And I, I didn't know quite what to make of Albers. So I went to see the show. And I uh, oh, you know, anybody could do this, it's no big deal. And I sat down in there and just started really looking at it, and then I saw what was happening with the color. Right. It was zapping around and right. everything there. And so just taking that idea briefly, not trying to reproduce the visual effect, just suddenly I had an idea for uh, uh, the square in the center, and then at the time I was using charcoal and uh, matte medium, which would uh, pick up the charcoal pigment and produce the gray. And so I did three, uh, three pieces with this same uh, idea. Of one here's, here's another one. Yeah, studio space. And that's based a little bit on the studio, the sculpture studio that was in uh, the, the San Francisco Art Institute. But it's really kind of just a made up painter studio. And then there was one other one, uh, a black uh, square in the middle that uh, Museum in Baltimore has called uh, The Nature of the Beast. And here we come for the first time to meet Mr. Unnatural. Mr. Unnatural, yeah. Yeah, kind of a counterbalance for our crumbs, Mr. Natural. Um, and uh, when I was at Davis, um, I met a, a guy in the uh, drama department, Dan Snyder, and uh, he was a wonderful artist. and. Uh, he had sort of high and low opinions of drama, even though he was in the drama department. And uh, got to be friends with him, and we started uh, combining uh, graduate students, or undergraduates as well, in theater mm-hmm. and uh, visual arts who wanted to do something other than just the regular. And he, with his influence in the drama department, got us the use of uh, the main, eventually the main stage at Davis, and so we would put on these uh, productions of art and mayhem and madness using a lot of local talent and occasionally bringing in somebody from the outside, Billy Barty, a uh, midget from LA came up one time and participated. And most of the time that happened, I was teaching there, but this particular Out Our Way, I'd stop teaching and Dan says, we're gonna do another Out Our Way, why don't you come up and uh, you know, join in? And so, coming in cold, uh, whereas before, kind of organically, whatever we'd done had happened while I was there, I thought I need some something to uh, cover me, or I need some character or something to uh, uh, find my way back into how I'm going to join with this particular uh, uh, event that we do. And we do several performances, evening, daytime, matinee, and um, while incredible visual things uh, were done. Jock Reynolds, who's now the director of the uh, AO <coughs> Art Museum, yes. was a graduate student at the time, did some wonderful pieces. Anyway, uh, I was sitting around talking to Bob Nelson one time, and he said, well, what are you going to do? And I was drawing at the time, and I'd drawn this figure very similar to this, and I says, I think I'll be this guy. And he said, well, who's that? And I thought of R. Crumbs, Mr. Natural, who, you know, short squat guy, and I was a tall, skinny guy, and I said, Mr. Unnatural. And not knowing if I'd have speaking lines or not, I decided to be silent and use a slate and uh, write on the slate for uh, whatever uh, I was supposed to say. And, uh, kind of like a silent film. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Free as a Bird from 1977. Got invited to uh, do uh, a cover for, they decided to reissue all of Charlie Parker's uh, music and when they were still making records. And they invited a number of artists to design uh, album covers. 
And so I read the biography of uh, Charlie Parker and uh, uh, and I actually I've been to Kansas City for uh, some shows with the Morgan Gallery there, and so um, it's uh, Bird is down here in the lower left. In the lower left, he's mm -hmm. playing the saxophone and mm -hmm. watching the vulture uh, over his head, and it's just kind of amalgamation of what I read in the book and uh, his Kansas City origins. Mm -hmm. And uh, food descending the staircase. Yeah, that's a, <laughs> another pun on uh, Duchamp's nude descending the staircase. There isn't